Let's try this again. And happy Earth Day. Uh, my name is Marianne Zeringham, and I'll be your host for 500 Women Scientists Earth Day Story Hour. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with 500 Women Scientists, we are a women-led nonprofit that is working to serve the public by making science open, inclusive, and accessible. And since we were founded in November 2016, we have worked to place equity and justice at the front and center of all of our programs. And so tonight we are presenting you with three stories from across the United States told by women working to promote earth justice through science, public policy, and their advocacy work. And you know, while we're thrilled to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day with all of you, we also do recognize that the work of conservation and of environmental justice has far predated our celebrations of Earth Day over these last 50 years. And so I think these stories will give you a little taste of how that work persists today. And I hope they'll inspire you as much as they have inspired me to continue working to protect and preserve our great planet. But before we get to their stories, I wanted to first introduce you all uh, to my co-host for the evening, uh, Samir Ranade. Do you want to come off mute and we'll see what? Yes. Whoa. Yes. Um, is this really echoing? Um, here, let me hear how we turn this. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just can't hear myself. But I think that's okay. Um, okay. <laughs> news from you in the chat box. So um, Samir yeah, is the... introduce myself in my my title and stuff. Um, hey, um, everyone! I'm I'm really excited to to be here, and um, thank you so much for joining. And this Earth Day, you know, has come at, at such a pivotal moment where we see um, the the reason why we all need to come together, and um, as as people. And I'm really excited to work with 500 women scientists on achieving a more equitable society. So um, I have written a bunch of uh, poems and um, um, interspersed throughout this conversation. I'm going to um, share some poetry. So I will go ahead and launch off with um, a first um, set of poems um, to get us going. So, okay. Um, happy Earth Day. I want to achieve a Green New Deal in the worst way. We should all come together, recognize that our cars can't run forever on oil. Before we run out of it, the planet is going to be spoiled. I recoil at the thought of people dying in their homes when it gets too hot. After 2020, I hope the government sets a new plot. I cry when I see the president deny science and divide, cut regulations to further a dangerous rise in carbon dioxide. As an individual, it's easy to feel powerless, but there's organizing to be done instead of spending our stress. To unite and engage others, we must do our best. Trust that society will support climate action that is just. See, our fate is linked to making it illegal to sell an ivory tusk. Make it so the moon earth system provides power after dust. Stored in electric trucks, manufactured by Volvo and the likes of Elon Musk. Make the jobs high wage, so saving the environment is a plus. For some of us, it doesn't matter if the economy opens up, if this equitable, inequitable system remains. The skies may be clear now, but the president has a plan to increase acid rain. Hospitals are strained, yet EPA wants a dirty car standard that creates heart pain. As the ice caps melt, its storm surge impacts are unevenly felt. When it comes to a healthy school lunch, why must the government tighten its belt? while the airlines get a big bailout despite their wealth and couldn't even commit to clean air standards to protect human health. Their money could have been better used by helping us move to more high-speed rail. Without a Green New Deal, I see hell. So I ask each of us to commit ourselves to ensuring we prevail. We must ultimately ban fossil fuel jets, boost jobs in tech among women of color and vets. To reach our carbon targets, we're going to have to turn the stock market upside down in a way that accounts for the pain when people drown. 
tornadoes and hurricanes leveling entire towns. We need to equitably and robustly fund FEMA. We must not only adapt, but focus on mitigation to save the hyena across the ocean. Combining universal and local benefits is my potion. To pass in community solar, I show ultimate devotion. Electrify locomotion with tidal waves. We got to combine campaigns to prevent streets from being paved to saving the whales. Track progress and not just clean energy sales, but the number of people free from jails on achieving justice. My solution center in the dragon's lair. I eagerly enter. It's my first set of verses. Thank you. Sweet. Awesome. Thank I'm you. I'm going so back to you. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I hope you're all ready for our very first storyteller of the night. Uh, let me invite her on screen. So our first storyteller is Lauren Gifford. And there she is. Uh, Lauren is a human environment geographer who researches carbon offsets. And she's also a mom, a teacher, and host of the new podcast, Carbon Social Club. And so Lauren, you now have the floor. Thanks, and thanks Samira, that was awesome. I feel really inspired. Um, so I was setting out for my first field research trip into the Peruvian Amazon the first of many to collect data for my PhD research. I was headed to the town, a town called Moyabamba in the state of San Martin. And that's the launching point for visiting the Alto Mayo Protected Forest, a large forest carbon offset project, also known as RED, which is a policy mechanism to reduce carbon emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. So I'm a human environment geographer, like Miriam said, and I was going there to learn what happens on the ground when someone in the US purchases carbon credits from this specific conservation project. What was going on in the Alto Mayo that prevented deforestation and increased uh, forest carbon sequestration? So unlike a lot of graduate students, I wasn't part of a lab. I wasn't following an advisor or other academics. I wasn't joining an existing project. I was headed to the jungle completely alone to see what I could find. I flew from Denver to Dallas, Dallas to San Salvador, San Salvador to Lima. I spent a few days in Lima and then returned to the airport to hop a small plane to Tarapoto, a city on the edge of the Amazon region. Once in Tarapoto, I rode a three-wheeled covered motorcycle to the Colectivo station, where I caught a Colectivo, a sort of independent group taxi, that took me on a three hour windy ride to Moyabamba, where I took another motorbike to my hotel, one of the only places visitors could stay in that town. Moyabamba is remote and it's a regional agricultural hub on the cusp of major development. Many households don't have running water and there's only a few paved streets downtown. It's not a tourist town and they don't see many visitors from outside of Peru. I spent several weeks catching rides as deep as I could into the protected forest and exploring on foot to see what types of settlement, development, and agricultural activities were going on. I took meetings with forest managers and conservation practitioners, but I was mostly alone, chatting only in my self-taught Spanish with folks I encountered along the way. Most nights I ate alone in the same restaurant in town. One night I saw a man staring at me from a few tables away. He was about 70, white hair, glasses, kind of short. He finally approached my table and said in English, I can tell by your accent that you're not from around here. And I was like, really, that's just my accent? <laughs> we started talking and his name was Luis. He had grown up in a nearby village, uh, but he had spent most of his career as a cardiologist in the US. He invited me to come with him the next morning to see a little medical clinic he was building in the village Yotalo. It would be a day away from my conservation research, but field work taught me to be flexible and to say yes, so I agreed. The next morning it was pouring rain and I was surprised when Luis actually showed up on foot to meet me at my hotel. Because just as much as field work taught me to say yes, it also taught me to be very skeptical. Luis and I took a colectivo to Yantalo where we were stopped by armed men along the road. Luis handed them a few coins and told me, they're okay, they're protecting the town from outsiders. I was terrified. 
In Yantolo, Luis first took me to see the existing medical clinic, a two room building with three walls, a collapsing roof, and a few very ill patients on, in a line of hospital beds. I put on my sunglasses so the patients couldn't see me cry. Next, we went on to see Luis's clinic, which turned out to be a big mud pit in the middle of a field with some concrete and rebar sticking out. We walked over to a lean-to where construction workers were having lunch. Luis showed me a wall with detailed architectural plans for a small hospital, a cafeteria, a crematorium, and an organic farm. I was struck by the contrast between this mud pit before me and the advanced professional plans on the wall. I asked him, who in the US knows about this? And he said, do you know Dartmouth College? And I started to cry, but this time from joy. Dartmouth, my alma mater, a place I love with all my heart, had sent engineering and business students to Yantolo to help with designing the clinic and to make a business plan. It was in that moment that I started to believe what Luis was telling me all along, that this little medical clinic would become one of, if not the premier medical centers in Northern Peru. Over the years, each time I returned to Moyabamba, I took a day to visit Yantolo. And when, I was, and when he was there, I saw Luis. I spoke to Luis on the phone several times from the US, asking what they needed at the clinic and what I could bring to donate. I even made a few small grad student sized donations to the clinic, very small, like $20. The last time I went to Yantolo, the clinic was completely built and the organic farm was thriving. I checked out the air-conditioned operating suites, the cafeteria, and walked through the adjacent, the adjacent pineapple fields and mahogany plantation. Luis wasn't there. He was actually visiting family in Colorado, which is where I live. Mm -hmm. um, but I had lunch with a visiting intern from St. Louis, learned about teams of volunteer doctors and medical students who would come through to help build capacity and treat urgent patients, and I left a bag of toys for kids who were coming in for care. What became of the clinic at Yantolo was beyond what I could have ever imagined that first time I visited with Luis and saw the mud pit and the architecture plans. I've moved on from studying the Alto Mayo protected forest. The more I learned about carbon markets and climate policy, I realized that those types of red projects aren't the best, aren't the best sites for studying the offset mechanism. The research questions that took me there just don't seem that interesting anymore or even valid. But what, but I still would like to return to San Martin, not for the research, but for the people. Luis, his kindness, and the clinic at Yantolo remain close to my heart. One of my biggest takeaways from years of traveling to the edge of the Amazon is that research will shift, field sites will come and go, my career will evolve. But one thing that remains, that remains important is the humans I've met along the way. Thanks. Yay. Thank you so much for that. My, my cat Tesla was so excited that she, uh, that she joined along to hear about the power of connection and that so much of the support. most important support. Yeah, yeah. The, the the support of the animal community is behind you and your story. Um, yeah, I thought that that's so powerful. The idea that um, the connections that we make along the way are just as important as the work it is that we do. And so I thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Lauren. Uh, that was really awesome. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great, great. Um, I think Miriam's screen is frozen. I'm not sure, but I can um, go ahead into um, the next verse. But I, I just want to say, like, you know, I've worked on um, climate policy for a while and, um, you know, the importance of, um, of having good, positive uh, forest conservation um, efforts is important. You know, um, like, like we, it, it can be a very critical way to improve um, local economies and improve life. Um, in, in a lot of communities, I mean, there, you know, like people have also highlighted some controversies with it. So I like the fact that you're um, interested in like seeing how it plays out on the ground because it, um, you know, 
tree conservation can definitely do a lot. Um, Thank you, Lauren. Hey. We'll, we'll take you off screen. Oh, Miriam, or is that, was that you? Okay. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. All right. So let me go ahead and um, dive into the next uh, verse. Um, I'm trying to prevent planetary warming and bring the whole world together like we did when we saw a hole in the ozone forming. To play to his base, the president ignores warnings, or maybe it's to appease big oil. For the sake of our planet, I hope to see his re-election bid foiled. The choice I present to voters is that we either drown or bring back manufacturing to mill towns. We can revitalize rural America with forest conservation. Can't wait to go to the state of Montana and start these conversations. In Michigan, I'll tell the jobs making clean car parts. See the growth of the green industry in Bloomberg's bar charts. Can't forget the importance of saving the aardvark. Biodiversity must be maintained. It's not just ethical, but necessary for ecosystem health to see species remain. This next one is focused a little bit more on the beginning, the intersectionality of, of climate change and um, the intersections between racial justice and a healthy environment. Um, the way we live is strange. That life is affected by race, gender, or income is a shame. With Obama's election, I believe we made some positive change. Then again, it's 2020, and there's still controversy over the killing of Emmett Till, brutally tortured and thrown in the river. The thought of it gives shivers up my spine. The only way to react is to wake up my mind and devote my time to honor his memory and the tragedy of Dr. King's death in Tennessee. We must reform the voting laws of Mississippi See, it trips me up to know there's voting laws on the books from the era of Jim Crow for kneeling during the anthem. They call it extreme, but courts won't uphold the constitutional amendment number 14. What Mitch McConnell did was the ugliest form of disrespect to our flag I've ever seen. Merrick Garland, if he were there, our air would be more pristine. In my dreams, we would be back on track to implement President Obama's clean power plan. But the Republicans were mean. Wind towers can create jobs in places like Texas. And so I hope to work at the nexus of bipartisanship, electrify the Lexus. I look to the EPA administrator to protect us, not neglect us. The laws on the books collect dust. The agencies run by political hacks who don't give a damn about asthma attacks and pollution caused by diesel from train tracks. All right. So that was the second set of poems. Uh, Miriam, are, are you there? I am. You want to go yeah. ahead and talk, otherwise I can also introduce the next speaker. Yeah, that, can you hear me? Samir? Um, okay, I will uh, go ahead then and introduce. Okay, the well, um, second well, she's story. still getting ready. I'm going to introduce um, Jewel. Um, Jewel is an ecologist on um, working on her PhD at Georgetown University. She's on the leadership team for um, 500 women scientists and um, she's really inspiring with her work. So um, Jewel, I'll um, let you take it away. Um, hello, quick sound check, I'm okay. Yep, hear you. The first time that I visited my salt marsh research site, I was already nine months into my PhD program. After a five hour ride in a cramped field truck from DC to New Jersey, I step out into the summer sunlight. Grass sprouts out of the black muck underneath a huge blue sky. The land is flat, very flat, so that my field of vision is filled with blue and green and blue. Blue sky, green grass blue water. The water is salty. The air is a little salty and every creature that lives here is a bit salty. This is a salt marsh, a coastal land feature made of sediment held in place by grass roots, submerged twice daily by the salty ocean water. Even at low tide, the marsh is a bit soggy, muck squishing underneath my boots. But at the highest tides, the salty water covers all of the grass. 15 years ago, I was a preteen, um, stuck in a cul-de-sac in suburban central Texas, hundreds of miles away from the coast, and I had never heard of salt marshes or even seen one. But now I've learned that salt marshes have a global distribution, and they're all along the United States coast, including the Texas coast. 
I've learned more than 75% of fish, shrimp, and crab species need salt marshes during their life cycle. And just by existing, salt marshes save coastal cities from hurricane floods by absorbing water that would otherwise go into homes. And just by existing, salt marshes store carbon in their roots, keeping it out of the atmosphere. The salt marsh seems so simple when I look at it from a distance. It's just grass, water, and sky. But I'm a salt marsh ecologist, so I spend much of my time in the salt marsh looking down and up close. Between the sediment and the grass stalks, I easily find dozens of fiddler crabs darting out of burrows, hundreds of coffee bean snails lurking in the mud, and millions of plant hoppers bouncing stem to stem. Thousands of species, from microbes to insects to fish to birds, have been identified at the particular New Jersey salt marsh that I am working at for my PhD. I'm relatively new to the science of salt marshes, but my PhD advisor, Gina, has been studying this specific New Jersey salt marsh for 15 years. When we trek through the salt marsh together, she remarks to me about how she's noticed changes. She points out to me a brown bamboo pole sticking out of the muck. It's the kind of pole that we use to mark our experiments. She tells me that when she put this bamboo pole down several years ago, the bamboo pole marked the edge of a grass patch. But the grass patch that we see now is small and its edge is yards away from the bamboo pole. She tells me that the bamboo pole now shows her how much the grass patch is shrinking as grass dies and leaves behind muck. Then Gina points to some ponds. She tells me how she saw them form over the past years because when she started working out here, those ponds were grass, grass that died and left muck, then muck that became ponds as the sea is taking over the marsh. My PhD advisor says that she can see the effects of sea level rise at our salt marsh research site. So she's been working there for 15 years. And I start to think about how in those 15 years, over 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide has been pumped into Earth's atmosphere because of grossly unregulated industry. I think about how in those 15 years, ice has melted and ocean water has warmed up and expanded such that the global sea level rose about two inches. And I think about how in those 15 years, the sea level rise in New Jersey has been faster than the global rise. It has been three inches. And in the next 15 years, it's predicted to rise six more inches. And this rise would put pretty much all of our salt marsh underwater, not just at the highest tide, but at all times. Our salt marsh isn't just changing due to climate change, it's being totally lost. Before I started studying the salt marsh for my PhD, I didn't take climate change very seriously. I thought bulldozing nature, that's a big problem. I thought air and water pollution and environmental racism that goes with it, that's the urgent problem. I thought breaking single use plastic everywhere, <laughs> that's the urgent problem. I used to think climate change wasn't urgent. I thought it wasn't affecting people yet. But now as I'm studying a sinking salt marsh next to a coastal city that needs the salt marsh to be intact and healthy for the city's protection from hurricanes, I see with my own eyes that climate change is urgent. It's a problem happening now. It's a problem connected to all our other problems and making it all worse. So I'm a salt marsh ecologist and now I'm salty at these fossil fuel executives, these politicians, these so-called leaders who have had the evidence about carbon emissions and climate change for decades longer than I've even been alive. I'm salty that so many scientists before me have done a lot of work, published a lot of reports, and advised a lot of leaders, and yet global carbon emissions are still increasing each year with no real plan to stop. 
As I research the sinking salt marsh, I struggle with what I believe the role of science is at this moment. I'm watching my scientific career studying an ecosystem that will be totally lost to sea level rise within the next 15 years. More science isn't going to save my salt marsh study site and more science isn't going to save the people who live on the coast who can't afford to leave their homes here in the next hurricane. I know that more science won't solve the problems of climate change and I feel such restlessness because, well, I feel like I do know what will solve them. In the next 15 years, I want to see policy solutions that totally phase out fossil fuels and, and carbon emissions and environmental destruction. I want to see new leadership in politics and business in every aspect of society, new leadership that actually listens to science and cares about people's well-being and enacts bold changes in energy production and ecosystem protection. And I know this will only happen if millions of people hold leaders accountable and push for it, speak up for it, vote for it, protest for it. It won't happen just because of more science. So I know it's a long shot, but I do want to see my salt marsh saved. If sea level rise can be limited to only a few more inches because carbon emissions were stopped, then maybe in 15 years, I'll be able to come back to the salt marsh and admire the blue sky, green grass, blue water that makes my skin and my hair a little bit salty. Maybe in this better future, the future that millions of us voted for and protested for, I'll be able to use my science to help restore salt marshes where the green grass is taking carbon out of the air and storing it safely in its roots. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jewel. I love, I love that both as a love story to your salt marsh ecosystem and a, I think how grief uh, translates into rage, which then translates into action. Um, and I think your story gets at that so, so beautifully. Thank you. I'll take Samir off. off uh, um, so uh, I think before we get to our final story of the evening and say bye to Jewel, um, Samir, do you want to, do you have another poem for us? Uh, yeah. Um, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, that, 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 um, I really um, was moved by uh, Jules' passionate um, talk and, and just the need for policy action um, is just so I imperative. It is really frustrating. So um, these next two verses will um, go into that a little bit. Um, climate change is an emergency, damn it. It's simple, even if Trump can't understand it. Our relentless, undivided focus is demanded. Our future is on the line if you want me to be candid. People will suffer as we see deserts expand. I'm implementing an equitable and effective fossil fuel ban. We don't need energy that leaves people with heart disease. I hate to see our stream flows decrease. Let's run cars on hydrogen, electricity, and grease. Put up huge wind towers off the coast to catch the ocean breeze. We can bring emissions well below zero. Plant trees like my hero, Billy Frank. The next Democratic president must enact a green bank. Those who are most burdened by filling up the gas tank will get a grant. Uphold the deal President Obama courageously made in France. For the sake of my niece, I'm committed to seeing clean energy advance. This is for job creation that results in poverty alleviation and improves everyone's living situation. The Green New Deal is built on justice and innovation. And um, in this next verse, I want to uh, start out by talking about in Washington state, we passed a law to um, strengthen our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, so I wrote this as we were doing that. I want to Washington to extend and achieve its greenhouse goals. It's going to take way more than getting off Centralia coal. We're going to have to implement economy-wide emission controls, species protections for endangered sharks and grizzly bears in national parks. The current administration wants to drill on public lands, ignoring it kills. What's the point of earning a dollar bill if it makes the people you're serving ill? What we need are solutions that combine technological evolution with the social revolution. It shouldn't take bravery to
All right. Uh, we had uh, some some technical difficulties, um, but we are now live at this link. Uh, I hope everybody in the last chat got uh, got notified to come into here. Um, and I think since since Samir uh, had wrapped up his um, his poetry, uh, maybe what we can do is bring on our final storyteller uh, of the evening, Emily Pinkney. Uh, I will bring you on screen now. And while we wait uh, for her to join, um, I'll give a quick intro. So Emily is a marine biologist and environmental justice advocate. Uh, she's a dancer of 24 years and works at a zoo on conservation leadership development. So really a woman of all trades. Um, hello, you're here. Hi, yeah, I'm glad that I made it over <laughs> to yeah, the next yeah. one. Oh my goodness. This is our first time uh, running such a such a live event, um, and Ooh. so showbiz, even virtually, is crazy. But the show must go on, and it shall. <laughs> uh, so, do you want to bring us home, Emily? Yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. Yeah, the stage. Um, I never thought I'd find myself living in homelessness when I was asked to work for um, the Washington State Environmental Justice Task Force. Um, at an early age, my parents both instilled this appreciation of the environment in me, uh, but they both lived very different lives. Um, both of them lived about same income levels, but my mom is from Germany. She grew up in the Black Forest, trees all around, and my dad grew up in the pre-EPA South Bronx, so very different lifestyles. When we moved to Washington State, uh, I was lucky because I had the privilege to work on social justice and environmental justice uh, issues and environmental science with my father. Um, he was in Washington State actually helping with uh, Superfund sites, cleaning them up, talking about um, environmental hazardous waste, but uh, also talking to people about the environment. Um, I got to work with him at a very young age, around like seven years old. And at this time, this is around Around this time, I think I decided that I wanted to go to school to become a marine biologist. I really enjoyed, though, talking to people and talking to, how, to people about how we interact with our environments and what that looks like. When I was in college, though, I quickly understood that I was very different than a lot of the other marine biologists. Um, I realized that I wasn't necessarily denied a place at the table, but there was never a um, I was the only black woman in my class um, all the way throughout to my senior year of college. And this led to a lot of my environmental justice work. Um, the work that I did as a child and the work that I did with my father in the community, the work where I talked to people and learned about people and their experiences within nature. And I connected that to a lot of the marine biology that I did in school. Now, fast forward to after college. When I was done with school, um, I moved in with my mom because her mental health issues started to increase a lot. Um, her struggles grew to a point where it was impossible to talk to her about it. And um, she went untreated for quite a while. And unfortunately, her paranoia grew. Um, our relationship was really strained and the strain became more as I started to do more environmental justice work because I wanted to explore our relationship our relationship as I'm her black daughter and she's my white mother. And what does that look like? And the more I started to understand things about restorative justice and systems of oppression, it actually split our relationship further. The fracture in our relationship, um, it actually culminated to her having a psychotic break that led to her evicting me and taking the only assets that I had. And this led to me being homeless and the this was on the eve of me getting some of the most important news of my life. And this news was when I was asked to be a part of the Washington State Environmental Justice Task Force. Uh, this task force is a group of individuals, um, a lot of folks that were appointed by the governor who work within different departments in state government, but there were three open um, community positions. And so I got to work on the task force as a representative of the Tacoma Urban League, meaning that in my position, I was representing the black community of Washington state. 
the strain on my relationship with my mom actually impacted the relationship that I have with certain allies in the environmental justice movement. I was really honored to serve on the task force because it was a huge turning point in my career. And it was the first time that I felt that uh, people were appreciating that the science that I had to bring, but also were recognizing my connection with my neighbors. I was given the opportunity to finally use the connections I had with the community and also just my passion for environmentalism to better my home. And it felt that my science was finally having a purpose because I got into it because I wanted to better the world and I wanted to better my community. I also though, again, quickly realized how difficult engagement is when there are so many barriers of entry. I realized that I was experiencing a lot of the same trauma that I was actually trying to prevent my community from suffering as well. So the outcomes of the EJ task force process, the document that uh, we will complete by the end of this year, it became even more real for me. Hearing people's struggles to make it just to public comment periods because of things like childcare work or transportation, hearing folks talk about how it's really hard to keep their fridges stocked and not having the ability to pay rent were also everyday concerns of mine. Even having a job living in Washington state, specifically in the South Puget Sound area, the cost of housing was absolutely high and it still is. Justice work also, what folks tend to not understand, even if you're in a position of privilege, it's a very demanding and it's really emotionally exhausting just from things like compassion fatigue for others, but especially a lot of folks who do start to work in environmental justice spaces, a lot of them are people who are also from the communities that they're trying to serve. And so I thought to myself, how could I help my community or my state when I was really in a position where I couldn't help myself? Um, and again, what I realized is like, there are many people who had the same exact story as me, but this was my opportunity to share mine and sharing my story with people, not just in the community, but also having the platform of being on the state level and talking to policymakers face to face, sharing my story with people has been one of the most important things that I've ever done with my work. I realized that I was in a position where I could actually build trust where bureaucrats have failed before. Um, I don't just share these stories with my community, but we share the same zip code. And that means so much. That means so much for the people that we're doing this work for. I realized that my sphere of influence among my neighbors and fellow activists had a sort of power, a sort of power that I think goes unrecognized a lot and the type of power that has actually moved people to their environmental decision-making that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's people power. Um, it's the power to impact lives in a very intentional way through local engagement. And it's incredible in a way that sometimes global engagement doesn't work. Um, it's like caring for your family and more likely than not, what impacts your neighbor is it's gonna impact you too. What I really found to be the solution for a lot of the issues that I had was the strength and the beauty that I found in true allyship, uh, whether that was meals, um, or a shower to wash in, or a place uh, for me to sleep, or a friend giving me dog toys so that my dog had something to play with and didn't have to think about what was going on, or even just folks helping me with the security deposit of my apartment. Um, my allies used their privilege and their power to care for me in my darkest hour, and that repaired my relationship with just the concept of allyship. It also extended my empathy to think about the fact that we are all very different people, but at the end of the day, all people have needs. And I still live in the same neighborhood that I serve, but now I have a, more of an opportunity to thrive. I have a roof over my head. I have a fridge full of food. Um, and it took for those strong and trusting allies for me to reach the place that I'm in now. Um, the mentors that I had came in all ages, um, all experience levels, uh, all different industries. Um, I was helped by many folks from Five for Women Scientists. I was helped by artists in the community. I was helped by people who, you know, I've known since I was a child who own a small business around the corner. And yes, this was people of several different races, different backgrounds and different ethnicities. Um, since then, I do have a job that pays me an equitable wage and it keeps a roof over my head. 
but that's only because my community was there for me. And so right now in my life, it's my job to be there for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm going to pull uh, Samir up, but I think, um, I think your story so gets at the heart of why stories are and our stories are so incredibly powerful. Um, having that that microphone is such an incredible privilege and being able to use your power in this way to to tell your story, to relate to the people who you're serving and also to speak to truth to power as you're doing this, this work of environmental justice is so incredibly powerful. And I'm so grateful to you for, for sharing that story with us on this uh, 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Yeah, um, thank you, Emily. And it's really, um, it's really, I really love uh, working with you on the EJ Task Force and your knowledge and the fact that um, you're just so you're just everywhere um, on, on these issues. And, um, and just, you know, like um, it's your contribution, so invaluable. Thank you. Thank you both. We will, uh, we will now bid farewell to you. Um, and close close this all out for the, the evening. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, who have tuned in to our virtual story hour and to thank our storytellers again for sharing their stories um, about what makes them tick, what's recommitted them to this work of, of preserving and protecting our planet. And to thank uh, Samir again for his awesome poetry. I hope that you're all feeling inspired and invigorated to keep doing the work of earth and environmental justice. Um, you know, tonight might be officially Earth Day, but it is our duty um, to work in these spaces every dang day of the year as the earth keeps turning. Uh, and I just want you all to remember that there is great work happening across the country and around the world in this space. And all you have to do uh, regardless of, of your background, of your expertise, is to show up to listen and to learn, and to learn particularly from folks uh, from marginalized communities whose voices matter the most in this movement. And so now I want to turn it over to Samir to, to give us a couple of calls to action uh, to take with us into the rest of our evenings. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see in the chat box, I. Um, Put two things out. Um, you know, I realize this is a national call. Um, you know, I work on state stuff, but um, one thing that, that we need to do nationally and repeatedly is ensure that that Congress, um, in the in all of the future uh, legislation that they do um, for the COVID, um, in terms of the relief um, and, and and strengthening the social safety net as well as the recovery. Um, to you know, rebuild the, our economy. That those things are embedded with the principles of justice. So, um, and and what you can do um, with that is go to the People's Bailout website. That's kind of connected to the Sunrise Movement. And um, it, importantly, the principles of a Green New Deal really have to do with the government targeting its programs, its enforcement um, to undo social um, inequities. And so. Um, and so it's really important that we have that in, in all of the future stimulus legislation that we have going on. And I also shared the link to Green for All where you can get further involved in that and there's some state level campaigns. But um, you know, I, I want you to start please thinking about voting and participating in the election, locally organizing and making sure that you can um, be a part of, uh, uh, of the local voting efforts um, because we wanna make sure that there's 100% turnout in this election. So. Um, Feel free to contact me. I'll put my thing in the chat. Um, if you want more background on that, no matter what state you're in, I can give you that. But the People's Bailout um, and Green for All are probably two really good national things um, that I would say to focus on right now. And um, thank you so much. We will make Earth Day every day together. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Happy Earth Day every day. Bye.